the flickering light of Asia or the Assyrian nation and church. Within two months after the death of Mar Benyamin, his brother Marpolus was chosen by the church and ordained to succeed the lamented patriarch. The elevation of Marpolus Shimon to the patriarchal see took place in the presence of a vast audience in the church of Mart Maryam, in the city of Ermia. On the 15th day of April 1918, thus Ermia, as a Babylon of Islam witnessed for the first time in its history the ordination of a successor to the man it had so treacherously betrayed and slain. Perhaps no better portrait of the new patriarch could be given than the one, as it appears in a few paragraphs of his own patriarchal address. Delivered at the same time and in the same service of his elevation and ordination, Marpolus Benyamin, who now commanded both authority and power to have avenged the blood of his brother and to have punished the leaders of the conspiracy in the assassination of his predecessor, spoke thus to the great audience which was also sprinkled by the religious and political representatives of Europe and America. Beloved sons in the Lord, by the grace of God I have been called to occupy the patriarchal see of the Eastern Church. I do, however, confess my weakness and declare to you that the sacred service is far above my feeble strength. The tremendous responsibility becomes particularly great at this particular time, when both our church and our nation are face to face with a terrible crisis. Without your assistance, the task will be entirely too great for me. However, I am not seeking your assistance in word only, but also in your deeds and in your Christian conduct. You and I must together keep close to the mercy seat of Christ, that he may enable us to conduct both the affairs of the church and of the nation in accordance with his own holy will. The holy scriptures are full of promises for us, if we only ask by faith, however corresponding with our humble petitions and our declaration of dependence upon the Lord, there must also appear the beauty of our Christian conduct and our Christian life. Our history of 16 centuries should be a lesson to us. During the long ages that are past, we have suffered afflictions, persecutions, and massacres, which are beyond the power of human pen to describe, and yet we have not been consumed. We have been preserved and kept by a mighty hand and by a holy will. This should be an assurance for us that God the Father has a holy purpose concerning us, and the purpose must surely be that we may become a light and a blessing to the millions of our race who still remain far away from the truth of the gospel. When we have understood this, then will we learn that we must not depend upon the arm of flesh or upon the power of man. Our hope and our trust may always be in the Lord and in Him only. We should also remember the commandment of our Savior to love one another and to be kind and merciful toward our enemies. We should abstain the revenge and should be willing and ready to forgive those who have done us great evil. We must remember that plunder is an abomination to the Lord and must keep our hands clean from possessing that which does not belong to us. Even though we have been robbed, we have been plundered, and we have been deprived of our homes and of all our possessions. It is our duty to defend ourselves as a nation and protect the sanctity of our family shrines. But we must also recall that our main mission in the world is to make known the name of our Christ and to reveal the spirit of his gospel among the races and the nations who know him not. This we must do, not by a mere profession of our lips, but by a conduct dominated by a heart filled with his love. We are compelled to defend ourselves, as I have said before, and to preserve our national existence. This task may demand greater hardships yet, and greater sacrifices. Perhaps we have not given enough blood yet, nor has our capacity for suffering and sacrifice been filled to its full measure. But in all circumstances, we must keep in our mind that the fact of all true greatness is in one's kindly feeling toward his enemies. Such was the spirit of the lamented Mar Benyamin Shimon. Let the sweet example of his life dominate our attitude towards those who hate us. He died, he gave his life for the flock he so dearly loved. Let us honor his sweet memory by loving one another and by being kind toward our enemies. I, Polus Shimon, your patriarch and leader, beseech of you all and ask of each and all of you to become true witnesses of your holy profession. The blessing of the Lord be upon you all. Amen. The period of the new patriarch's incumbency was destined to be short. Physically not strong, his feeble body continued to grow weaker and under pressure, continued to grow weaker under the pressure of grief and sorrow, till it was finally swept away by the awful deluge of his people's affection during their last exodus from Ermia. 
he lived however long enough to find himself in the midst of the historic ruins which had once stood as the pride of his forefathers and as the glorious seat of his illustrious predecessors. The British Medical Service of Baghdad did its utmost to prolong the life of the new patriarch, but human pharmacopoeia does not prescribe for palliative that can drive grief away, or even a sedative that will soothe the pain of an aching heart. The memory of the glorious past which still lingered amid the melancholy ruins of the once greatest Assyrian center of education and missionary enterprise added another tributary of sorrow to the already overflowing stream of his people's woes and hastened the end of the new patriarch's life. Thus, shortly after the arrival of the Assyrian refugees in Bakuba, Mesopotamia, Marshamun Pelos died and was buried in Baghdad where the bodies of numberless martyrs await the quickening echoes of the first resurrection trumpet.